past number of weeks, for those of you who haven't been here, I'll just quickly do a, a review. We've been looking at a, a number of messages along the lines of Hebrews chapter 12. If you want to turn there for a minute, we'll take a quick look at that, just so you guys who haven't heard, we can get you quickly up to speed before we get too deep into this. We've been talking about how the Lord disciplines us and chastens us, as Hebrews chapter 12 says, and the reasons why he does that and the reasons we need to submit to that. It says in verse 11, I won't go through the whole chapter, but in verse 11 it says, Now no chastening, for the, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable, truth, peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And we've been looking at, you have to be trained by God's chastening. It's not something that just comes natural to human beings to allow Him to do work in their lives. And then we looked at the parable of the sower where there was four different types of ground that the seed fell on. The seed speaks of the word of God. Jesus talks about and he said that the first the seed fell on hard ground and the birds came and ate it. And that speaks of people who hear the gospel yet reject it and it falls on hard ground and and the enemy comes in and and takes what what they heard and, and devours it. The second type of soil we looked at was the, the soil where it, it, it fell on the stony ground and it sprang up quickly. But when the sun came up, and Jesus told us what the sun is, it's trials and tribulations and testings, the discipline and chastenings of the Lord. When the sun came up, because it didn't have any root, it withered and died. And the next type of soil was it fell among the thorny grounds. In other words, the ground with all the weeds. And because the weeds sprang up, it choked out the good seed. And we looked at last week that the good seed, that, that those thorns, he talks about, the, the, he says, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. And the cares of this world can be a lot of different things. It can be our careers. It can be our hobbies. It can be a lot of different things in our lives. And it's very, I think anyone here who served the Lord any length of time can attest that the cares of this world will quickly choke out the true riches if we let them. And then we looked at very briefly the deceitfulness of riches, how in our society, riches is what it's all about. I work up at the border And I can't tell you how many thousands, and I'm not exaggerating, thousands of people came down when the lottery, the $1.4 billion lottery was available because, you know, they all wanted to, all wanted to strike it rich. Well, that's the deceitfulness of riches. And it's interesting because Jesus said what? It is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, he didn't say it was impossible. Certainly the Lord blesses different people with wealth because he knows they'll use it for his kingdom. But it is difficult. And and let's be honest, riches very much lead to the cares of this world. When you have a lot of money, it takes a lot of effort to manage it, and it's very tempting to spend it on things that aren't building the kingdom of God. And then the last type of soil said it fell on good ground. We have a lot of farmers here in this, this congregation, so you guys can all, all, uh, all sympathize with that. You want your seed to fall on good ground. And when it fell on the good ground, it sprang up, it took deep root, and it was fruitful. And he said that those who it, who it sprang up, it, they had 30-fold, they increased 30-fold, 60-fold, or 100-fold. And that's obviously the type of Christians we all want to be. But, but, how many of you know, for those of you who aren't farmers, it doesn't take rocket science to figure out good ground doesn't just happen. In this country, we have tons and tons and tons of rock. It's very rocky soil. And the farmers here that are in our congregation, I've been to their, their farms, and there is just piles of rocks that over the years they've had to pick out of their fields. You have to take a plow. You have to break up. The, the hard ground and the Bible actually says that it says break up your fallow ground and I think it's an interesting thing that he says break up your fallow ground the you isn't understood there in the English language you break up your hard ground and the way we do that is we allow the Lord to come in with his plow called trials called difficult times called chastenings called discipline and start breaking up the hard ground of our hearts and if we don't submit to that then it's just basically like the plow skipping across the ground it's not going to do anything And this morning, before we get any deeper, this is basically the last sermon on this whole thought. We looked at also being broken, how one of the the keys to allowing all this to happen is to have a broken and contrite heart. How many of you know the Bible says, to this man will I look, to him who is of a broken and a contrite heart. And on the reverse of that, he says what? He resists who? The humble? No, he resists the prideful. And the way that we become not prideful is we allow him to break us. If you've ever been through difficult times in your life, and I'm sure everyone here has, because the Bible says man is born to trouble like the sparks fly upward. If you have times, there's times where it's just like, man, I feel like I'm just completely broken. I'm, I, I don't have anything left. And that's actually 
where God wants us to be. That's the point he wants us to get to because then it removes all self-dependency from us and we become totally dependent on him. But as humans, we're very naturally inclined to figure things out on our own. We want to do things our way. We want to figure out our problems. We're problem solvers. That's just kind of how we are in our nature. But God wants us to rely on him to solve our problems. So this morning, before I get too deep into this, I want to ask a couple questions. How many of you have ever gone through a trial in the past? Oh, okay, everybody. How many of you are currently in trials? I think we can all say there's areas, some maybe more, some maybe less. <clears throat> and let me ask you this. Have you ever had a difficulty seeing the love of God during that time? Have you ever thought to yourself, Lord, I, uh, I don't know really what you're doing here, and I'm just going to be straight up honest with you, I don't like it. I know that's how I feel. There's been some things... For those of you who don't know me, there's been a lot of things this past year that have happened in my life. That's why I'm preaching this series of messages, because I'm preaching more to me than I am anybody else. And I know there's times where it's like, Lord, um, you know, I understand you're trying to deal with things in my life and you're trying to get at things. But, you know, the last trial you put me through was kind of difficult. And the one at, now this one's difficult. And it's like, how many more trials are you going to have to put me through? I mean, it's like, what's going on here? And it's very easy to get frustrated with the Lord. It's, I mean, it's, and anybody who says they don't at times is probably not being completely honest. We do get frustrated with the Lord. We want to ask why. Well, the whole context of what we've been looking at the past few weeks comes down to this. If you want to turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 15 this morning, John chapter 15. I want to tie all this up this afternoon, and I want to bring some, some peace. I may, not, I may not answer every why, but I can certainly, hopefully I can bring to you some some light to the issue. John chapter 15, we're going to read verses 1 through 8. This is Jesus speaking. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And this is an interesting phrase. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And we've looked at recently how abiding in the Lord is one of the keys of, of bearing fruit and allowing him to do things in our lives. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. Does that kind of countercultural to what we hear nowadays and what we think a lot of times ourselves? We read all this stuff, but then we go out and live our lives and, well, I can figure this out and I can get this solved on my problem. And all of a sudden the Lord starts taking away the ability to do that and that's where we get kind of irritable. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. So you will be my disciples. And what I want to focus on this morning is every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, he cuts away more branches that it will bear more fruit. I'm not an expert by any means at gardening, but I do know that a tree left to itself doesn't begin to produce a whole lot of fruit. It has to be constantly pruned and, and, and trimmed. And he says here, the vine is Christ. Now I want to make it clear this morning, Christ is not just one of our life sources. The vine isn't just a life source for the branches. It's the life sources, source for the branches. So Christ is the vine. The branches are us, those who are Christians. We're connected to that vine, and the fruit is what we produce as those who are connected to the vine. That just kind of stands to reason that if we're, we're a great grapevine, so to speak, is what he's talking about here, that we should be bearing some grapes. And it's easy to say, well, what are the fruit? Well, how many of you have read Galatians 5, or the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. You've got to have a little bit of that when you're going through trials. Kindness, goodness. It's tough to be kind and nice to people when you're going through trials. Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's interesting, he says, those who bear fruit get a reward. Or, I'm sorry, it's interesting to think that we, we have in our minds that when we bear fruit, well, we're going to get rewarded. That's kind of, again, that's, that's what our culture tells us. Hey, you, you know, you do well, you get a reward. But that's not what he says here. Bear fruit, and what happens to you? You get pruned. You get pruned. 
It's not really what we expect deep down. I think that's why it's easy to get frustrated with the Lord. I've been faithful. I've been bearing fruit. I've been bearing love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I see that coming out in my life, and all of a sudden you drop a piano on my head. What's up with that? That's not cool. Well, it's because he says, no, I don't want you to just bear fruit. I want you to bear much fruit. I want you to bear much. I want you to be the best vine, the best branch, excuse me, that you can be. It's not really what we expect deep down, and it's very countercultural to what we hear all over the world today. Now, a tree or vine that never gets pruned may look like it's full of life, right? You see these weed trees, these big giant cottonwood trees, right? They, 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 look, they look luscious. They, look, they have leaves everywhere. They got branches everywhere. And a vine or a tree that's left to itself produces all kinds of growth. If you have, my dad has lots of fruit trees at his house there in Michigan. He's got pear trees. He's got apple trees. He's actually got a grapevine. He's got all these fruit, fruit trees. And it's interesting that when you let those bad boys go to themselves, they just grow like crazy. And they got branches everywhere. But they don't produce fruit. That's the key. They don't produce fruit. In other words, it's all, it's all for show. It looks real good. Looks real, wow, that tree's really healthy, but when you go up to it and you're, you want an apple or you want a pear, you want a grape, there's nothing on it. And that's no good. That's not why you have fruit trees. On the other hand, a tree or vine that is pruned may look at first like there's a lack of life. It's interesting to me over the years when my dad went through and started, <laughs> he gets a little crazy sometimes. I think he, he, he likes growing trees just so he can cut them down. He's got like two or three chainsaws and he's got all sorts of trimmers and he just, he loves, bought a wood chipper so he can just chop, but he just loves it's just something about that chopping up trees he just loves. But he'll go out there, and man, I mean, he's just, choo, 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 choo. he's sniffing branches and left and right, and there's a huge pile, and he starts a big bonfire in his yard, and it's like, oh my goodness, Dad, I think he killed that tree. It doesn't look like there's anything left, but it's amazing. Once harvest comes around, all of a sudden there's all this fruit. All that pruning, even though that tree looks pretty dead it, initially, it looks pretty broken, all of a sudden it begins to bear a whole bunch of fruit. That's certainly what the Lord is looking to do in our lives, and that's what he's saying here. And at first, God's pruning, just like those trees that get trimmed, pr God's pruning in our lives may at first appear to be sapping the life out of us. You ever feel that way? I am just have no energy, I have no strength. God, you've, <laughs> you've just cut it all away. Well, that's, that's good. That's exactly what he's trying to do. It is the process of being broken and learning to let go of self-dependence, like I said a few minutes ago, and have a complete, not a partial, not a mostly, but a complete reliance on Him. Trusting that His judgment is best and that the things He prunes in our lives are for the best. He calls Him the vine dresser. How many of you have ever had the Lord, you feel like the Lord's taking something out of your life, you're like, wait a second, this is all wrong. This isn't, this isn't the, the branch you're supposed to be cutting, Lord. <laughs> I got a couple other ones you, you can cut. I don't mind giving you those up, but, but this one, this isn't so much the one I think you should cut. But we have to remember, and we're going to see a verse a little bit later on that bears this out. He only prunes the things in our lives that are needful. He only does what is good. Now, I want to quickly look at the different types of pruning that we can, we can apply to our lives spiritually. First, he cuts off dead branches in our lives. Dead branches, how many of you know, they can hinder, or in, hinder growth or injure trees of, or in, in, and injure the, the healthy branches if they're left. They can fall and, and, and totally stunt the growth of the healthy branches. I think this can speak to the dead wood of sin, the sin in our lives. The ungodly habits, desires, and influences in our lives that are the dead, it's like dead branches that he has to trim away. He prunes straggly branches that are too long. How many of you know that if, the branch gets too long and it's not strong enough, it can easily break. They're weak. He wants to prune the areas in our lives where we're weak, overextended, imbalanced, too busy. That's a big one in our society. Self-reliant. These branches need to be pruned so that they can become strong and able to hold the weight of much fruit. How many of you know people that are always really busy are generally very energetic folks? Right? My, I have a lot of family members like that. Maybe some people think I'm like that. Well, that can be a good thing if it's channeled properly. That's not necessarily a bad thing in and of itself, but when you allow that to begin, you're busy with work and you're busy with home and you're busy with the kids' school and you, you're basically just running around all the time and you never have any time, again, the, the cares of this world that choke out the true riches, he's got to prune some of that in your life so that it can become a branch that bears fruit, that isn't 
isn't weighing you down, that isn't, that isn't overextending you. We tend to, sometimes I think in, 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 as Christians, we, we're very prone to always say yes to people. We want to help people. But there are times, I really believe this, that we have to say no. Because we become, we're very quick to become overextended in our, in our lives. He even prunes the strong branches. How many of you know that if you cut off a little bit of a branch, the, just, just the end of it, it stimulates new growth? Even the areas where we are doing well. And see, this is where it gets really tough. Lord, I'm bearing fruit. I seem to have good things going on in my life. I'm seeking you. I'm not chasing after the things of this world. And all of a sudden he comes in and he's like, <laughs> like what gives here? What's going on? You know, even the areas that we are doing well, he wants us to come higher and go deeper. So he gives us a little snip off the end to stimulate new growth in prayer, new growth in worship, new growth in praise, new growth in giving. Even the areas where we're doing well, and we looked at a few weeks ago, different examples of all this. David, of course, when he sinned, he got some major pruning in his life. But then you look at a lot of other men in the Bible, like there's different times in Abraham's life where it's like, he seemed to be doing what was right, and he still got pruned. We're going to look at him a little more in detail in in just a few minutes. Now I want to quickly look at the process this morning of this whole pruning. How many of you know that spiritual pruning is an invasive process that brings discomfort to our flesh? You know that? I'm sure you can, you can agree with that. It, it, it's invasive, and it brings discomfort. We don't like it. But if branches aren't pruned, they won't continue to grow. We, we, we all want to grow, or so we say, spiritually, yet then the Lord comes, the heavenly vine dresser comes and starts pruning us, and we're like, well, wait a second here. <laughs> well, I thought you wanted to grow, son. I thought you wanted to grow, daughter. This is what I got to do. It says he's the vine dresser. God is the master gardener. He is the master gardener. I don't think it's coincidence that he put us in the Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden to start out with. God obviously likes, the Bible has a lot, to just, just like we talked about, the seed and the planting and the pruning. He, 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 God must really like trees and, and, and growing stuff. It seems to be his thing. I think he, what he really likes is growing humans. He likes growing people to bear fruit for his kingdom. And he's the master gardener, and as such, he doesn't hack away at a tree. When God comes and starts pruning in your life, he doesn't have a machete. When I was a kid, I, 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 more, of course, the ones that you know me, I, I like guns and I like knives and I like hunting and all this stuff. And for some crazy reason, my, my dad went on a mission trip to Guatemala and he came back with a machete. Now, I don't know who gives an eight-year-old a machete other than my dad, but he gave me one. And he had built a brand new uh, uh, mailbox holder. It was real nice, you know, treated, you know, four by four lumber and real fancy. And he just put that up and my mom's on the phone one day, and with my brother, he was uh, uh, going to Bible school in Guatemala, and she's like, David, I got to go. Your brother's out there hacking up the mailbox with his machete. And I'm, uh, I don't know what I was thinking. I guess I was playing soldier or something, and I'm out there just whittling away on my dad's new mailbox, and I felt that one on my backside quite firmly, and uh, I didn't do that again. But that's kind of the picture I think people have of God sometimes, that he's just a big kid with a machete just whacking away at our lives, just wherever it lands, it lands, and and he's just going to cut and hack. And, but that's not how he is. He's the master gardener. When he prunes, get this, it's with surgical precision. Surgical precision. How many of you know when a surgeon goes in to do surgery, a heart surgeon, you know, we got Ben Carson running for president. Seems like a really good man. But I, I'm pretty quite confident when, brain, when, when Ben Carson did brain surgery, he didn't just grab a saw and just like, well, I think this looks like a good spot and just start cutting this guy's skull away and working on his brain. That's, that's not how he worked. He's, it's very fine-tuned. It's very precise. And the surgeon isn't passionate about the cutting. I don't, think, I don't think doctors get real excited about having to go in with a scalpel and just start cutting people up. What they're passionate about is the healing. They're passionate about the healing. That's just like God. He doesn't prune things in our lives because he just enjoys whacking off branches. He prunes things in our lives because he's passionate to see, our he- to see the healing process, to see us grow, to see us bear more fruit. There's a precision to the whole thing. I really believe that trials and tribulations are graduate courses. It's real easy to stay a kindergartner in the kingdom of God. It really is. And I'm going to be quite blunt. Churches are full of kindergartners. There's a lot of people that want to come and play church. They want to be saved and go to heaven. I heard one guy said, I want to make it to heaven by the skin of my teeth. 
Well, with that attitude, you might not. Maybe you will. But that's not what God wants for us. He doesn't want us to just make it. He wants us to be what? Overcomers. He wants us to be fruitful for his kingdom. How many of you know the parable of the, of the talents, right? He gives the one guy one ten, he gives the other guy five, he gives the other guy one. Well, what would the guy with one do? He buries it. The guy with ten goes out and multiplies it, doubles it to ten. The guy with five goes out and multiplies it to, 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 to or I'm sorry, the guy with ten multiplies it to twenty. The guy with five multiplies it to ten. The guy with one hides it and brings it to him and says, I, I knew you were a hard man gathering where you haven't sown. And it's interesting, the master in that story never argues with him and says, no, I'm not a hard man. He actually says quite the opposite. He said, you knew I was a hard man gathering where I haven't sown. You should have at least put my money in the bank so it could have got interest. So clearly, the Lord is all about us growing and, and, and not just staying kindergartners. But trials, if we want to become more and we want to mature, I really believe that trials are graduate courses. And it's interesting to me, and I say this with all conviction, the most godly people I have ever met in my life the most mature people, most mature Christians I have ever met are often and almost always usually the ones who have been heavily, heavily pruned. I know some very godly people that, and I knew them when they were younger, and they weren't quite so godly. There was a lot of dead branches, there was a lot of straggly branches, there was a lot of other different things in their life, and, and there wasn't a lot of fruit that you just wanted to go up and, oh, I think I'll take that, and you know, yeah, they're real long-suffering. No, they weren't real long-suffering. They weren't real kind. But all of a sudden, God began to heavily prune them, began to put them through the graduate courses of the kingdom called trials, began to use the plow called tribulation in their life to break up their ground. And now you meet these people, and they just ooze with the kindness and the graciousness of the Lord. And you talk to them, and it's like when you get done talking to them, you're just so uplifted and encouraged to, to go deeper in Christ. Trials are a necessity. Listen to this. They are a necessity for those who want to grow and mature in Christ. They're a requirement. It's not really even an option if you want to go deeper in the Lord. But they're also tests. Genesis 22, verse 1 through 3, it says, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. How many of you know that the Bible says Abraham and God were friends? Matter of fact, they call it a Christophanes, a, an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. Jesus actually came and met Abraham. Obviously, this man Abraham, he's called the father of the faith. There's something really un unusual about this guy. He left everything in his home country and went and just headed out because God came and told him to. What a godly guy. And as I said earlier, we think pruning usually is sin or maybe the cares of this world, but often we aren't really seemingly doing anything wrong. And he says, I'm going to test you. I want you to be even more mature than you already are. It says, now it came to pass that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and I love this, he said, here I am, here I am, Lord. He was quick to answer. And he, then he, God said, now take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. How many of you know Isaac was the, the son of promise? That was what God said, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And this is how he did it. He performed a miracle that Abraham and, his old, and Sarah in their old age had a son. He says, take him to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now, if you had a voice come to you and tell you to take one of your kids and go offer him on a mountain, what would your reaction be? I know what mine would be. That's the devil, and this is ridiculous, and I'm not listening. Get thee behind me, Satan, right? And if I did think it was God, and I was sure it was God, we'd be having a big, long discussion about this. What does Abraham do? The very next verse, So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. No arguments. No big, long discussions, at least that the Bible tells us. Maybe there was, maybe there wasn't, but that's not what the Bible says. He says, Abraham, here I am, Lord. Go sacrifice your son. Next morning, he doesn't wait till noon. He doesn't wait till 6 p.m. He gets up early and goes and does it. And it is interesting, and I won't go through the whole story because it's really not pertinent to what we're looking at today, but it is, it is interesting that when he tells his servants, he says, me and my son will come back to you. Abraham obviously had a complete faith that the Lord was going to raise him up from the dead or something. Abraham was fully trusting God, but it was a test. And obviously we know 
He didn't sacrifice his son. God stopped him and gave him a lamb, but it was a test. But why did Abraham pass that test? Well, Hebrews says in chapter 11, the, the heroes of the faith, the hall, hall of fame, the Bible that a lot of people talk about in Hebrews 11, it says, speaking of Abraham, for he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is who? God. God. He knew that God was going to build the city, that God was going to do something in his life, and that's what he was looking for. He, and he passed the test. I heard about a young woman one time who was suffering greatly, going through a lot of trials in her life. She confided her frustration to an older Christian friend and said, if God loves me as much as you say he does, why did he make me so? The older godly woman replied, he is making you now. He is making you now. He is, his purpose, God's purpose for us is to prepare us not just for this earth, but for the eternal kingdom that he's going to bring. He's, here to, he's, he's shaping us down here, right? So that we will fit up there. I don't know who, if you've ever heard of Amy Carmichael. She was a godly woman that lived many years ago, but she wrote, a wise master never wastes his servant's time. Have you ever felt like God's wasting your time? Have you ever felt like, Lord, these trials, <laughs> you've put me through so many of them lately, I don't even care anymore. That's not the, what he's doing. He's not wasting your time. He's not just putting you through, like I said many times over the past few weeks, he's not just a mean kid up there with a magnifying glass trying to shine the light on his little ants and watch him squirm. There's a purpose to all this. How many of you know the worthiness of a ship is not determined while it lies in the harbor, but when it's on the waves of a storm? Right? But the worthiness of our spiritual life doesn't mean a hill of beans if when God puts us through a trial, we crack and, and sink. And the only way that's ever going to be found out is when he tests us. I'm quite confident if Abraham would have failed the test, listen to this, if Abraham would have failed that test, I have a strong suspicion he wouldn't have fulfilled God's purpose in his life and he wouldn't have been the father of faith. The pruning process does not happen all at once. And that's, that's the thing. It's like we have this conception. I know I do. Like, Lord, okay, I've been through the trial. I conquered. Now let's just live happily ever after. But that's not how it goes. It doesn't happen all at once or once for all. It takes a lifetime. And it's interesting to me, speak, going back to what I referenced a little earlier about godly people. Those of you who know me know my mom passed away this past year. It was interesting to me. The hardest years of her life, the biggest trials she ever faced were the last seven years of her life. But you know what's amazing? That woman met God more intensely than she'd ever met him in the previous years of her life, bar none. It wasn't, uh, well, when you were 20, you went through a hard time, and when you were 30, it was right up until she passed away and entered into his kingdom, she was going through trials, and the most intense of which was at the end. The heavenly vine dresser continually removes, continually removes from us what hinders our productivity. And even though we think it's really difficult and maybe even harmful at times, how many of you know the greatest harm God could bring to us would be to let us go, to leave us alone, to just let us start growing branches everywhere that aren't, that aren't good. It's kind of like little kids. Sometimes because of my schedule, I work rotating days and afternoons. Sometimes I will sleep in late and we'll hear a bunch of stirring around up there and you go up there and all of a sudden, these, <laughs> these rascals have gotten into the cupboard, and there's cereal in the carpet, and there's this candy wrappers everywhere, and they, you know, I, we laugh. So, well, at least these kids won't starve if we ever died in our sleep. <laughs> They'll figure it out, at least for a while. But how many of you know that kids left to themselves aren't, aren't producing any good things? <laughs> They're usually making messes. You know, that's the big phrase in my house. Stop making messes. I don't like messes, because I'm the one that has to clean it up. We're trying to teach them how to clean up their own messes, but only to a point because they're not old enough to get too, too good at it yet. But if you leave kids to, the, to yourselves, and you guys said you're teachers, if you leave kids to yourselves, to themselves, the teacher walks out of the room. I know when I was a kid, I know what happened. We certainly weren't studying our math. We certainly weren't taking our tests real well. All of a sudden, problems begin to arise, right? Well, it's the same thing with the Lord. If he leaves his kids to themselves we begin to go all different directions that aren't the ones we need to be going. 
real quickly as we move this on this morning through this, I want to just briefly mention, and this is something that we're very tempted, it's very tempting to do when we go through trials. First Corinthians, a warning. First Corinthians 3, verse 10 says, According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, another builds on it, but let each one take heed on how he builds it upon it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire excuse me, will test each one's work of what sort it is. What did he just say? Gold, silver, precious stones. That sounds good. Good thing to build on. But then he goes on. Wood, hay, and straw. You know the, 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 the parable of the house that was built on sand and the house that was built on the rock. The one that was built on sand, when the storm came, what happened? It washes away. The house that's built on the rock stands firm. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. It's very easy to build, as I said, to be a kindergartner in God's kingdom. It's very easy to build houses with wood, hay, and straw spiritually. But how many of you know gold, silver, precious stones, where do those come from? The what? From the earth. And how do, we, how do we get them? Are they just laying up on, I mean, they're like daisies, you just kind of pick them up off the fields? No, you got to dig for them, right? It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of sacrifice. So it is spiritually. If we want to build with good things, gold, precious metals, and stones, spiritually speaking, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of sacrifice. Wood, hay, and straw, you can find that just anywhere. That's easy to get. He says, the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work. When the fire comes in our lives, it quickly tells you what your house, your spiritual house is made of. Because if, if you begin to burn up quickly, well, you're building on hay, wood, and straw and we need to be building on the right things. Hebrews 12 says, pursue peace with all people in holiness. There's a precious stone. Without, with holiness, and this is interesting, without which no one will see the Lord. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. But this is what I want to bring out. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of gra the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness, we're talking about planning, right? Springing up cause trouble, and by this, many become defiled. Around here, weeds are a big thing. I love to hunt. Well, there's one big prerequisite. Don't drive all over our fields and spread weeds. That's a biggie. Why? Because they spring up and they cause trouble. And they don't just stay in one place. They quickly excel and, and go other places. Bitterness is like that. When we go through trials, if we become bitter, which, let's face it, we're very prone to do as humans. I know I am. You get upset, maybe even with the Lord. Lord, you get bitter. That's going to spring up. That's a root. That, that, that's a plant as well, but it's not producing fruit. It's killing the fruit. It's the opposite of good fruit, and it's the opposite of producing life in others. Bitterness is like a poison. It just, it just kills whatever it touches. It's a pest and a disease in our spiritual walk, but it's easy to do when you're going through the painful process of pruning. But if we learn to abide in him, like he says here in John, we can have full confidence and be rest assured that his work and his, what he's doing will, like Roman says, how many of you know, he will work all things together for good for those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. Turn with me this morning to Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations chapter 3. I'm going to try to read this quickly because of time. Lamentations chapter 3. kind of an unusual thing maybe to go back to the Old Testament when we're talking about something in John 15. But I think you'll see in just a minute when I get through this why I bring this up. As I said this morning, I want to get to the whole point of what the Lord's heart is in our trials. Because it's very easy to have a big misconception of what He's up there doing. And the Bible says His ways aren't our ways. His thoughts aren't our thoughts. Right? And it's very easy to say, well, I don't know what you're doing, Lord, and I can't even know because your thoughts and your ways are so much higher than mine, but I'm not liking it down here. Well, I want at least, I think this will bring a lot of solace when you go through trials. He starts out in verse 1, I am the man 
who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. Have you ever felt that way? (laughs) I am the man, I am the woman who has seen his affliction. He has led me and made me walk in darkness and not in light. Surely he has turned his hand against me time and time again throughout the day. I want you to think of the trials in your life and, and, and see if this is the way you felt. He has aged my flesh and my skin and broken my bones. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and woe. He has set me in dark places like the dead of long ago. He has hedged me in so that I cannot get out. He has made my chain heavy. Even when I cry and shout, he shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with hewn stone. He has made my paths crooked. He has been to me a bear lying in wait, like a lion in ambush. He has turned aside my ways and torn me in pieces. He has made me desolate. He has bent his bow and set me up as a target for the arrow. This guy has a way with words. He has caused the arrows of his quiver to pierce my loins. I have become the ridicule of all my people, their taunting song all the day long. He has filled me with bitterness. He has made me drink wormwood. He has also broken my teeth with gravel and covered me with ashes. You have moved my soul far from peace. I have forgotten prosperity. And I said, my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. Remember my afflictions and roaming the woodwork the wormwood and the gall my soul my soul still remembers and sinks within me if we stop right there that's a pretty bleak picture and i think we can all identify with that at different times in our lives obviously this guy felt that way or he wouldn't have written this but here is what i want to bring this all down to this morning This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. What he's about to say. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Because why? His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I have hope in Him. It's almost like he went through this whole thing of how bad life was. Because I don't even have hope. And then almost it's like the light bulb in the cartoons went off in his head. Therefore, I have hope in him. The Lord is good to those who do what? Wait. Wait. You want to know one of the keys to getting through a trial? Waiting. Waiting for the Lord. Be stand, and still, still, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. You ever got tired of seeking him in the middle of your trial? It's very easy to do. It is good that one should hope and wait, what? Quietly. Very often we're like little kids who when they don't get their way, they jump up and down and stamp their feet. They're not waiting quietly. For the, wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone and keep silent because God has laid it on him. He him let him put his mouth in the dust, yet there may be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes him and be full of reproach. For the Lord will not cast off forever. And this is what I want you to to, to get in your heart this morning. Though he causes grief. People nowadays in a lot of different churches are, oh, the Lord's just here to make you happy, wealthy, and wise. Well, maybe they need to read Lamentations chapter 3. Because that's not what it's saying here. It says, though the Lord causes you grief. What do you think Job was thinking when he went through his trials? He knew who was behind that. Yeah, it was Satan who the Lord allowed to get at Job. But Satan couldn't have done it unless the Lord gave him permission. The Lord was behind it. How many of you remember last week that Job said, the Almighty troubles me. He didn't say Satan troubles me. That's the other thing we get in a lot of churches. Say, I bind you, Satan. And, and people just, they, they pray more to Satan almost than they do to God and talking about how, you know, I'm going to tell the devil to get lost and this and that. Well, <laughs> they're, not fo- they're not realizing who's the one that's troubling them. The enemy is just a tool in God's hands. Though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he does not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. I want you to to get that deep in your hearts this morning, that verse 33. He does not afflict willingly or grieve the children of men. The literal translation in the Hebrew, when it says he does not afflict willingly, is that he doesn't afflict us from the heart. It's like when I discipline my children, 
Can't tell you how many times I've told them, we believe in, in the, the board of correction applied to the seat of learning here at this church, and I've told them time and time again, I say, do you think that the first thing I want to do when I get home is take you to your bedroom and give you a spank? No. Right, I don't. But I'm also not going to let you get your own way. Because if I do, if I let, leave you alone to yourself and your own devices, you're going to grow up to be the kind of person, I don't tell them this, but this is in essence what I'm saying, you're going to grow up to be the kind of person nobody likes. Maybe if more people had that idea, we wouldn't have jails full of juvenile delinquents right now. But it's like, I'm not going to let my kids, and my dad used to tell me that, I'm not going to let you go your own way. If you're going to go your own way, you can, but you're going to fight me on along every step of the path. I'm not just going to let you do what you want. I'm not just going to let you willingly go down the wrong path of sin and end up in hell. I'm going to discipline you. I'm going to use this rod of correction to drive foolishness out of you because I love you. Because I'm not, I, when I discipline my kids, it's not like I'm happy about it. It's like, oh man, I, some days I'm like, they sure need it. I, I hope they give me a reason. But I still don't enjoy it. I don't, I don't get pleasure out of disciplining them. What I get pleasure out of is seeing their little broken and contrite hearts after the discipline, and, and in my house, we spend time and we pray, and I say, okay, you need to ask the Lord to forgive you for lying or for hitting your sister or whatever the case may be. And it's amazing to see the difference in their attitudes. There's a brokenness there. That's what the Lord's doing. He doesn't afflict us because he enjoys it. He does afflict us. It's not saying he doesn't afflict us. He doesn't afflict us willingly or from the heart. It means you don't, he doesn't do it with delight or enthusiasm or with an, an enjoy, a joyful passion. Isaiah 30 says, And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teacher will not hide himself anymore, but your eyes shall see your teacher, speaking of the Lord, and your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way, walk in it, and when you turn to the right or when you turn to the left. Does that encourage you at all this morning when you think about the trials in your life? The Lord does not willingly afflict the sons of men. Yes, he's going to give us the bread of adversity. Yes, he's going to give us the water of affliction. But he doesn't do it out of a joyful heart of just doing it. He does it because he's trying to do something wonderful in our lives. Some of the ways that we can cure our bitterness or our, our struggles, Psalms 34, 1-5 says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be on my lips. My lips. That's why here at this church we focus on a lot on worship and singing and praise. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces are never covered with shame. Are you starting to get the picture here of waiting on the Lord, of rejoicing in the Lord, of seeking Him, of being patient, waiting quietly? Now, but when I say waiting quietly, I don't think that means not praying. I think that means waiting quietly, not going out on your own and trying to fix these problems, allowing the Lord to fix them for you in His own good time. Psalms 9, verse 12 says, He does not ignore the cry of the afflicted. You read in, when, when, you, when we just read in Lamentations, those first verses, he basically said, the Lord doesn't hear me. He shut me in like a hewn stone. He doesn't even hear my cry. But that's not true. The Lord does hear us because obviously he figured that out. To start in verse 22, there's a big radical change. Psalm 119, I think this 92, this is interesting. If your law, what does the law speak of? Your word, your ways. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my afflictions. When you go through trials, what is your response? Are you seeking Him? Are you praying more diligently than you ever have before? Are you worshiping? Job said, But those who suffer, He delivers in their suffering. He speaks to them and their afflictions. Let me ask you something. Job was obviously a pretty godly guy. We know that. But I have a sneaking suspicion that at no other time in his life, until we read the story of Job, had he literally spoken to God directly like that. Can you imagine that? I mean, we speak to God all the time. We may hear his Holy Spirit and press things on our hearts. Maybe you have heard him audibly. I don't know. I think it's possible. I don't think it's common, but I think it's possible. But we certainly don't just sit down and have a chat with God every day as far as face to face. 
Now, the Bible doesn't say specifically that Job saw God face to face, but there was obviously a serious conversation going on there. Do you think Job had ever had that before? All the years where there was this plenty in his life, there was all this wealth, there's all these riches, things were going hunky-dory and great. All of a sudden, God begins to touch his life. And Job says, those who suffer, he delivers in their suffering, and he speaks to them in their affliction. All of a sudden, God, Job, Job's ears got real in tune with what God was saying. What a blessing. <laughs> what a silver lining. Second Corinthians says in chapter 4, for our light, I like how it says this, our light and momentary troubles. Our light and moment, doesn't seem like that when you're going through it, but it really is. It's temporary, it's momentary, and it's really not all that heavy. Are achieving for us, now remember who was writing this, the guy that was stoned, that was beaten with whips, that was shipwrecked, that was thrown in prison, and eventually beheaded. The Apostle Paul. Apparently he thought his troubles, have you ever been whipped lately? Or thrown in prison for your faith? Or, or stoned? <laughs> Obviously that his affliction was pretty light in his own eyes he says for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all so we fix our eyes not on what is seen but on one but on what is unseen for what is seen is temporary what is unseen is eternal i think that's the picture you have got to have when you go through the trials in your life these are momentary light afflictions and what we're going to have what the kingdom we're going to be a part of far outweighs this vapor we call life it's interesting in hebrews 12 that we read at the beginning of the service day when he says no chasing for the present time seems joyous but painful nevertheless afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it you know what he says right after that Therefore, we sang this this morning, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight the paths for your feet so that which is lame may not be dislocated but rather be healed. He encourages us, strengthen yourself. Strengthen yourself in these words. The end result of all this, Psalm 119.67, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now, have I kept your word? For you are good, and you only do what is good. Do you really believe that this morning? When you're going through your trials, do you really, truly grasp that concept that God is only good, and He only does that which is good? It's easy to lose sight of that. But He says, before I was afflicted, before I was disciplined, like a little kid, I went astray. I did my own thing. But now, now I'm going to keep your word. Now I'm going to walk in the straight and narrow. John 15 that we read earlier, verse 8, he says, By this, after he just got done talking about pruning, by this, my Father is what? Glorified. Glorified. That you bear much fruit. Do you know that when you bear fruit for God's kingdom, it brings Him glory, which is what we should be all about? Pruning and brokenness can be very, very painful, but the result will pr produce godly fruit and much life in our walk, and abundant life in the vine. Psalm 1 says, He will be a, like a tree planted by streams of living water, which yields its fruit in its season, whose leaf does not wither, and whatever he does, is this, you want this to be your life? Whatever he does will prosper. 1 Peter 1, In this you, great, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. I, I, I think that's an interesting thing. He talks about over and over and over again. The fire, the heat being applied to your lives. You ever feel like the heat is being turned up? Maybe more than you like. Though it is tested by fire, it may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In conclusion, this morning, God's pruning in our lives is powerful in its pain, but even more so wonderful in the fruit that it will produce in your life. As God prunes and removes the things in your life that don't belong, or the things that are necessary for Him to remove, it will leave you feeling pretty stripped and bare. Pretty bleak looking tree. 
but in due season it will produce much fruit that couldn't have come any other way. It couldn't have come any other way. Nick, what was the, the Psalms that you opened up with this morning? Psalms 30. It's the very next verse on my list. I love it when the Lord does that. Weeping may endure for what? A night. But joy comes in the morning. And I want to ask you as we close today, are you lacking true joy in trials? Do you struggle with bitterness during trials the Lord sends you through? John 15, he says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and your joy may be what? Half full? Empty? No, that your joy may be full. God obviously knew when Jesus said these things that we were going to go through trials as Christians and that we needed some encouragement along this way. The pruning shears of the heavenly vine dresser will certainly cause us temporary discomfort. There, there's just no getting around that. He will grieve us. He will let us drink from the water of affliction, from the bread of adversity. But when we allow it, trials and tribulations to have the work that He is intended for, it will bring us a full joy that can only come from yielding ourselves to His pruning in our lives. Genesis 49 says, how many of you know Joseph, the story of Joseph? Talk about some serious, intense pruning, more so than I'm sure any one of us here have ever faced. A guy, again, like Job, didn't seem like there was any really need, for there wasn't some great sin in his life, just super obvious to everybody that he needed some pruning. But God decided, Joseph, you can't come into the potential I want for you until you take this detour to your destiny. It was certainly a detour. There's no doubt about that. Spending a bunch of years in prison and as a slave in Potiphar's house was a definite detour. But it's interesting because it says Joseph is a fruitful, did you catch that? A fruitful bough by a spring. His branches run over the wall. How many of you know when God brought in Joseph into his final destiny, after the detour, the whole world in that area was going through a famine and was blessed because Joseph had the word of the Lord come to him through dreams and all that and was able to, to, to store up grain, right? People were being blessed by the fruitfulness running over his walls. Is that, is that something you want for your life? Do you want the fruits of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the kindness, the patience, the long-suffering to be going over your wall so that when people walk by, the unsaved, the ungodly walk by the, the, the wall of your life, all of a sudden they see, wow, there's a lot of fruit there. They begin to pick it off. They begin to ask you questions. and Why, why are you so joyful in the middle of a trial? How can you go through these things and not be discouraged and depressed? How come you're not going and seeing every psychologist under the sun? How come you're not taking medication? Because I've realized the Lord prunes my life and He wants me to be better than the person I am. If we submit to God's chastenings, dealings, and pruning in our lives, we will be fruitful trees just like Joseph that have fruit hanging over the wall. Not just our own little garden, but a blessing to others. And those who pass by will be blessed by our life's fruit and God will be glorified. Heavenly Father, we pray that this morning the seed of your word will fall on good soil, that it will take deep root, and that it will start producing fruit even this very week, Father. That, Lord, when you bring the water of affliction and the bread of adversity in our lives, that, Father, we wouldn't chafe, that we wouldn't kick against the goad, but, Father, that we would submit to your dealings because, Lord, knowing that you do not willingly, out of joy, afflict the sons of men, but, Lord, that when you prune us, it is for a heavenly purpose that, Lord, you truly are shaping us down here that we may fit up there. That, Father, your goal is to do something awesome in our lives. More than just status quo Christianity, but, Lord, that you want us to be mature in your kingdom and fruitful in your kingdom, Lord. I ask, Father, that you would prune our lives, but, Lord, that you would give us the grace that when we are pruned that we will not become bitter, that we will not allow any bitterness to spring up and defile the good seed. But Lord, that we would let ha patience have its perfect work. Lord, we ask all these things for your name and for your kingdom. And Lord, we ask that you would bless each one here throughout this week and give them the glory of your presence. In your name we pray. Amen.